Uh, welcome everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about geosemantics. What we mean by this is anything has to do with geolocations and how can we understand the context spatially, uh, like talking about the data spatially, right? So uh, these are the, the topics that, um, uh, that are under the geosemantics. Uh, so the outline of this uh, lecture is going to be um, the semantics and the semantic web. What is the connection at, and how can we approach the geosemantics from a semantics perspective? Uh, knowledge representation, extraction, and retrieval. Uh, also about, uh, specifically about uh, geo-information. -informa um, and then geographic information retrieval and extraction. And then lately, the last part is about geosemantics processing. Uh, so let's talk about this theory that is called the semantic triangle or the triangle of reference. Uh, this theory was mentioned in a book called The Meaning of Meaning. Um, and this dates back to around 2400 years old. Um, this is important because it actually explains to us why do we need knowledge representation, how do we process data, and how do we understand things. Uh, and represent them for, to be processable or approachable by a human or a machine. Uh, so if, you have, if we have this term, Lebanon, as you can see here, uh, this is just as, um, like the words, the letters, uh, L-E-B-A-N-O-N, in English, represents something. Uh, it symbolizes a concept in your mind. If you don't know anything about Lebanon, never, do, never heard of it, right? then your state of mind, the conceptualization in your head is going to be empty. You don't have anything there, right? You don't have any idea. But if you have something there, then it refers to something in, on Earth, some, somewhere. It has a physical shape. It has a physical presence in the world, right? Uh, so this term at the end it stands for that referent in the actual world, right? Uh, so, for example, since I come from the Middle East, uh, when I hear the word Lebanon, immediately comes to my mind Lebanon, the country, which is uh, close to Jordan, right, where I come from. But for you guys, maybe the ones who live here in, in Ohio, uh, Lebanon immediately stands for the area here or the city in Ohio, right? And actually, in the world, the word Lebanon in English refers to so many things, like uh, around, let's say, maybe six or five regions on Earth that are called Lebanon, right? So now, what's the role of context here? How do we teach the, the, the computer uh, or the uh, information system, how do we teach it the context? And how do we know what is this term is stands for, right? Uh, and this is what why do we need semantics to put to data? And why do we need metadata to, to, to attach it to data so we can explain more things about, about certain, th certain things? Um, and this is what, the, what we are going to talk about today. And how do we achieve uh, a more um, uh, likely semantically rich data? And how can we reason about them? So let's talk first about the semantics and the syntactics. You know that these are two uh, uh, opponents. Uh, like semantics is the linguistic and philosophical study of meaning, according to Wikipedia. Uh, so we care about the meaning of stuff when we talk about semantics. And syntactics is the branch of semiotics that deals with the formal relations between signs or expressions in abstraction from their signification and their interpretations. So as you can see, these are two different ways of saying the same thing. Like I say that standing beside the Statue of Liberty versus standing beside the Statue of Liberty, right? So me and you, we have a mutual understanding that this symbol, this emoji, stands for the Statue of Liberty. And if we have an agreement, then we have the same semantic, we have the same meaning. Both of them symbolizes the same thing, right? And this is what uh, Tying the semantics and syntaxis is the outcome of this social agreement. So me and you agreed that this term is represented by this symbol. 
And this is the whole point of semantic web. We want, so the semantic web, as you know, is uh, an extension of account web in which information is given well defined meanings, better enabling computers and people to work in cooperation. Which means that if I know the meaning of the data, then I will be able to use it in processing of so many problems in so many applications, right? And that's why we need metadata, we need knowledge representation, we need uh, better interoperability between data sets. And that's why when the idea came of linked open data, right? But unless we have clear semantics, unless we have a clear understanding what all of these data sets means, then there is no way of achieving that goal. And that's one of the major, um, not drawbacks, actually one of the major weak points of semantic web, that it needs a lot of work to work, right? Uh, so first, let's talk about the knowledge representation, extraction, and retrieval from the information, again, from the spatial context. So now, as we said before about this triangle of reference, what does that mean for the semantic web, right? That means that all of these reference, if we have a dictionary of all of these location names, let's say, right, what we call a gazetteer, this means that if I want to represent this knowledge into something accessible, meaningful to the computer and to the users, this means that I need to add not only a taxonomy, which is a shallow ontology, that, is, that, that they call it, right? Which means, like, for example, there is Lebanon in, uh, you know, there are, like, I list for you a list, just Lebanon, five times, right? This is just very shallow. I don't know anything more. You have to tell me more, right? You have to add more semantics so I can understand you more, which means I have to say that Lebanon is a country, Lebanon geo-coordinates is this and that, Lebanon is a, a, a you know, a border countries is this and that, right? So this means I'm adding more, more semantics, which means the knowledge representation is, is, is richer, is more accessible, is more understandable, right? So when we do the codifying the, this kind of knowledge, uh, we are codifying actually such agreements between all of us, all of us as a community of, let's say, GIS people, right? Uh, all of us as a community of computer scientists, we agreed what is the meaning of a graph, what is the meaning of this and that in literature, right? So that's why the scholarly work is done, so we can define things, so we can all of us understand when we refer to them, right? So this is what we do with knowledge, uh, with, with codifying the knowledge or the knowledge representation. We are codifying such agreements by constructing ontologies and knowledge bases, right? And then um, it can be done as, as shallow as a taxonomy. Like I can say that United States states are, for example, Ohio, Indiana, and so on, which is just a list of these states. Or I can add more semantics and more relations, which means I, I'm, I'm going to add like the coordinates of this state, uh, properties like, uh, for example, the country that it belongs to, uh, all of these kind of stuff, right? Even the name, I can have different names in different languages, right? If I want to add more semantics to this, I can have even more relations between these um, entities or these records in the gazetteer, which means I'm going to say that Ohio is a neighbor of Michigan, uh, as a state, right? So if you have the coordinates, only the coordinates like what you see here, it's not guaranteed that you will have that knowledge that they are adjacent to each other, they are neighbors, right? Uh, because maybe there is like uh, just an edge of, uh, of a, s a state that, um, you know, uh, uh, like for example, the uh, Idaho, um, uh, there is uh, Colorado, right? Uh, not Colorado, um, Montana, right? And there is North Dakota. And there is an edge uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, I think, what is that? Uh, Four corners. Yeah, that corner is actually just like few minutes you can cross it. Like 20 minutes you'll be out. So you can't say that uh, North, North Dakota is actually ad ad an adjacent to that state unless they are actually adjacent. So you have to have a clear semantics, have a clear uh, 
kind of information that is codified in a knowledge base that can tell you such information, right? So that's why we need more semantics to do more things. So the, the actual gazetteers that we have today in, in abstraction of from, the, of from the semantic web technologies, we have examples like GNames, OpenStreetMap, and the Alexandria Digital Research Library. And the main components of these gazetteers are place names and place types and the spatial footprints. Spatial footprints means the geo coordinates uh, using the coordination system, the long-tailed latitudes, and so on. So the gazetteer operations is, if I give it a place name, I'm going to be able to see the uh, footprint, right? If I have a place name, I can know the type of that location. If I give a footprint and a type, sometimes I can have all the place names that are within, <coughs> let's say, a bonding box of a link to the latitude bonding box, right? So the significance of such gazetteers is to help machines to understand the geographical meaning of places, right? and to model the relations between locations. So for example, I can have a hierarchy of uh, a city is inside a state, a state is inside a uh, um, country, and so on. So now, this is the question. If I ask a gazetteer the following question, what are the states which are within 500 miles from Ohio? Do you think I will be able to get this kind of uh, answer from the gazetteer as it is? As we said here, this is the knowledge representation and, and the gazetteer. Do you think we will be able to? No. We will. Because we, we have all the geo-coordinates of all the states, right? And I have the geo-coordinate of the state that I'm looking for, I'm, I'm interested in, which is Ohio. So I can say that, go and calculate all the distances between this state, Ohio, and all the other states, and then remove all the ones that are with more than 500 miles away, right? But what if I say, what are the Ohio's bordering states? That's not possible with the current gazetteers. We have to have um, that knowledge codified somehow, right? So that's why, for example, we can say that an ontology is a, is, is a schema of a knowledge graph, right? Uh, it has the hierarchy. It can define all the uh, some of the hierarchy relationship between uh, between data points, but it doesn't have more semantics. It doesn't have uh, more edges between nodes that are constructing a knowledge graph. And we have an expert here. So as you can see here, if I if I talk about only a hierarchical, only a taxonomy. Like United States have Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky, and then I say Ohio have um, Toledo. Toledo and Dayton and so on, right? Then if I ask what are, how, what are the, the neighboring states of Ohio, I will not be able to answer this question because I don't have enough semantics. But if I add more semantics, I add more knowledge, and then I add even more edges and so on between these nodes, I will be able to get a fully connected graph of a very rich, very rich semantics representation. So, Alex, Alex, so what we what we are interested in now is to add semantics to the gazetteers to make them uh, uh, more uh, accessible and more uh, useful for us. Right. Uh, so, since the ontology describes the types and properties and interrelationship between concepts, which means uh, an ontology, as you know, is a schema-oriented with hierarchy that I can say that a world has continents and then continents have countries, countries have states, and states have cities. And then I can ask, uh, you know, answer questions like Dayton is in Ohio and Ohio is in USA and Dayton is a city, right? Uh, but if I want to do more than this, uh, then I have to construct something called the knowledge graph or also known as semantic network, which is a very old concept in literature. Semantic network, if you want to understand more about knowledge graph. Uh, so when we built a knowledge representation uh, using a knowledge graph, they revolve around the nodes. They revolve around the data, instead of around the hierarchy, like the ontology, right? It's fact-oriented of nodes as concept entities or locations in this case that we are talking about. So the immediate action uh, or immediate thing that we need to look at after talking about semantics is the geosemantics interoperability. 
which means it's the technical analogy to uh, human communication and cooperation. Like if I am telling you Lebanon, do you understand me or not? We have to have some established kind of communication so you can understand which one I'm referring to, right? So this, um, uh, we standardize the schemas of data using geospatial vocabularies, if we are talking about semantic web, which means uh, that I'm going to use a vocabulary that encodes such information inside uh, an ontology, right? Instead of, for example, the longitude latitude, I can say that these are actual longitude latitude that means something to a computational alg uh, algorithm or a computational function. So later on, I'm not going to uh, just uh, you know, uh, treat them as numbers. Instead, I'm going to treat them as coordinates. And that's why we need a schema. Uh, and, and we need metadata because we need the metadata to explain to us what this data is about and what does that mean, right? So the challenges of, of such things, of the semantic web in general, is the low adoption. Uh, so the biggest geographical uh, knowledge base, uh, such as uh, OpenStreetMap, do not conform to the semantic web standards. Therefore, some efforts have been done, uh, which is called linked geodata, which has uh, part, uh, you know, some of the OpenStreetMap codified there. Uh, and they try to uh, create an ontology and so on, confirming with the semantic web technologies. Um, the other possible solution, away, away, standing away for, some, for a while from the semantic web technologies, we can think about the World Geographical Coordination System, uh, which makes it much easier for us to, to do the distant uh, integration of multimodal data. What I mean by this, for example, if I have a sensor data and I have uh, a, a tweet, right, and both of them have uh, a geographical footprint of an intuitive latitude, then I can integrate them together regardless of everything else. I don't need anything more because we have an understanding what these two things mean, right? So I don't need to confirm to the uh, semantic web technologies to do such integration because we have a system that actually can calculate the ex like, like the specific location of, a, of, of uh, on, on earth of a particular thing that we are talking about right um, as an effort for uh, these kind of uh, gazetteers uh, for the semantic web uh, view geo names created an ontology of location names uh, and as you saw in the last lecture I think dr. Schiff told talked about the semantic sensor web Right? And this is an example of using the GeoNames uh, ontology, um, which uses, uh, like for example, as you can see here, has location, and then you specify which location is, at, you know, that sensor is where in that location, based on the GeoNames. And then this uh, URI means something in the ontology, referring to a location on that ontology of GeoNames, right? which makes um, this referent much richer when we want to retrieve it again, right? But again, all of these technologies are very, have very, very low adaption. They just use the gazetteer itself without adding any more, any more um, semantics to them, right? And they are much, much easier to access and much easier to use if we are using something like the geographical coordination system instead of uh, doing Sparkle queries and dividing them. I will give you an example of this and why this is very hard to do. I know I'm in semantic web uh, lecture, but I'm just trying to also show you the positive and negative sides of, of these kind of technologies. So again, uh, about the geospatial vocabulary from W3C. Uh, it was designed to provide the semantic web community with a namespace for representing latitude and longitude data and other information about spatially located things. Uh, so this vocabulary is used and designed uh, for us to, uh, uh, to better uh, facilitate the interoperability of, of data right? and to make it more uh, knowledge representation and so on. Um, 
So we can now, using this kind of vocabulary, uh, ask questions like, um, within a certain distance of a point, can I get, uh, give me all the locations as we said before? And within a rectangular polygon, um, can I get all the locations that are within that rectangular polygon? And as you can see here, here are the elements of this vocabulary, like um, spatial thing, which is a class for representing anything with a spatial extent, um, a point, which is a class of representing a point def uh, defined by longitude and latitude. Um, we have location, latitude, longitude, and alt uh, alt altitude of, of a spatial thing. So all of these things adds semantics, adds more meanings to a location that is defined in our ontology, right? As you can, this is just uh, the, the graphical representation of this. So we have a spatial thing, or a thing, which is a location, uh, and the location is a spatial thing, uh, uh, and this spatial thing is, um, you know, uh, based near such and such, which integrates with other uh, vocabulary like for, for example. So I can say that um, uh, a, a physical thing on Earth or a human being is actually living in such and such area, right? Which makes it more um, applicable to more applications and more usable with many things that you can actually integrate with. And this is an example of uh, a use of this vocabulary with FOF. You know FOF, right? Did you take this vocabulary? Um, so for example, this is a person defined, that's me, home page, and then FOF based near, and then geo, latitude is this, longitude is that, and this is part of the uh, WGC 84 uh, the vocabulary, right? So now, this kind of thing defined in the, in, the, in the data is have a meaning, like we can actually retrieve them and then do some processing with them because I have them defined in my vocabulary. Um, an example of query from DBPD using this, uh, this vocabulary is uh, such a thing that you can retrieve all the names, uh, alternative names and so on of locations within a bounding box. And if you are interested to see the result, this is the result of this query. Like you see, Del, Del Rad University, Louisiana, and so on and so forth. I think this is the bounding box of Louisiana. Right? So this was possible because we defined uh, and we connected these locations with their spatial footprint. Right? So now if we talk about the multimodal data integration that I mentioned before, uh, the geographical coordinate system, uh, which is formed by longitude and latitudes, as you can see here from this picture, is, uh, is a universal system that all of us agrees on, agrees on right? So we can say that uh, X and Y longitude and latitude uh, is in this location and we can recompute it and then we can reverse geocode it, geocode it or, or the other way around. So from a geocoordinate, I can get the name of that location, or from a, a that, uh, the name of that location, I can get the geographical footprint, right? So if I have two data points uh, from whatever data that I'm talking about, image, text, anything, right? If I have the spatial footprint for it, if I have a limited latitude, then I have there is a possibility that I can actually merge them, I can integrate them, I can say that this data and this data from different modalities, I can just merge them together, right? Because the spatial footprint is the same, right? Um, an example of this is sensor data and Twitter data. So sensor data like weather, let's say, and Twitter data like geotagged tweets. Um, so we can integrate both of them if we know uh, that they have limited latitude footprint, right? Geospatial thing. According to researchers in North Dakota, they determined that the weather station radius coverage of 30 miles should not be exceeded, which means that uh, a weather station can cover 
up to 30 miles radius, right? Which means all the points or locations that are within the 30 miles of a location of a sensor uh, station, weather station, right? I can make that, um, you know, I can propagate this fact to all of those, right? Because they are under the, um, the, the coverage of that uh, weather station. Um, and, and again, if, if there is no coverage for other places, right, I can interpolate the, uh, the weather readings. Uh, for example, this, uh, this station is here and this station is here and the 30, the 60 miles, there is one in the 70, let's say in the, in the middle of both of them, right? They are not covered by this or this. I can interpolate, I can say that, okay, the weather reading here and the weather reading here, I average them. This is one of the ways of doing it, right? As you can see here, this is from weatherunderground.com. Um, you can see that this is an actual weather station here, I think, in Dayton, Beaver Creek, Ohio. This is the spatial footprint for it, right? So I can say, for example, if there is, let's say, um, a, here, a Starbucks, let's say. Um, then I can say exactly, like, Starbucks has this weather conditions, right? Because, because for that weather station, I can propagate these facts to this weather, uh, to this location that are covered by this weather station. So the integration of data, what I mean by this, the integration of data is, is much, much easier if we know the spatial footprints and we have an agreed on system that can uh, have a clear semantics, right? I have the, uh, the, the world geographical system, which is clear to everyone. How can we georeference and re-reference uh, locations? <coughs> so now if I have a tweet, uh, like texts with metadata, Let's say that the text has messages, uh, you know, message content, the text, and the metadata, like for example, timestamps and GU coordinates. Then I can integrate it with the readings from the uh, the sensors, right? Which has also timestamps and GU coordinates. And that's only if the geo, geo if the tweet is geotagged or georeferenced. Georeferenced means that I was able to get the location of that tweet somehow, right? For example, if I have the tweet, uh, uh, if, if, for example, I was able to locate the user, like the user living in Ohio, let's say, or Beaver Creek, then I will say that, okay, uh, this tweet might be coming from such and such. If that tweet is mentioning a location name, right? For example, it said, uh, in, in case of a disaster, let's say, uh, like, um, you know, Colony Glen Highway is closed, right? And I know where Colony Glen is. There is an established context between the system and the referent, right? And the referrer, which is the author of this tweet, then I will be able to go and find the footprint of this location name and then link it with the sensor reading. And this is what we are trying to do here um, now, actually, in uh, what has uh, project, we want to link the the uh, location mentions, which has footprints, uh, to the sensor readings, uh, which are geotagged, right? Using the same integration method that we talk, we are talking about. Um, and this georeferencing is done either using NLP and information extraction machine, uh, and machine learning techniques. Uh, or if we can do the knowledge base, uh, knowledge base or a graph, uh, uh, you know, querying, for example, I know that uh, in the profile um, uh, of the user in Twitter, they are mentioning that I'm from Dayton, then I can just go ahead and then query the gazetteer and then know where Dayton is, right? I know that it needs disambiguation and so on, but at the end of the day, if we are talking about, um, like, for example, you can merge it with other features like the uh, UTC footprint of the, of, the, of the user, then I can know that data of this part of the United States and so on, right? The other thing is I can also do the social media analysis, uh, social network analysis, which means that if you are my friend and you are, I know where you are, 
then there is a possibility that you also, uh, I can be inference and I can know where, uh, where the other user is, right? And there are, all of these techniques have a huge amount of, of research and literature, so if you are interested, you can uh, find such things and why they are doing it and how. So now, uh, the third part of this presentation is about the geographical, um, uh, geographic information retrieval and extraction, what we mean by that, and, and, and so on. Um, so for the geographic information retrieval, we are retrieving from any type of data sources, uh, uh, any, any type of data sources, the relevant geographic information based on queries, which means if I have text, I want to extract all the geographical references there. Uh, if I have metadata, I want to extract all the information from there. If I have a gazetteer, I want to be able to retrieve them, right? All of this is under the boundary of, of geographic information retrieval. So if you are talking about uh, getting them from semi-structured and structured data sources, then we need data representation and annotation, uh, which is very crucial for, for <laughs> such things to happen, right? If data is not correctly represented or correctly stored and have a clear metadata and a clear semantics, then I will not be able to retrieve them, right? And that's why we need W3C, geospatial vocabulary, or GeoJSON for uh, all other things, like, for example, um, the uh, Twitter uh, JSON uh, tweets, when you retrieve them, they are actually encoded as a GeoJSON um, objects. If we are talking about retrieving the information, the ge geographic information from unstructured data sources, then that's where we need the information extraction, machine learning, and NLP techniques. And those are like, some of them is actually like um, uh, any other kind of problems, right? So we want to extract those location mentions from text uh, using a uh, whole lot of techniques like sequence labeling, gazetteer matching, or whatever. Right, and each one of these have different uh, performances depending on the data that we are talking about, and so on. So in, in in GIR, we try to establish the query and the candidate results. Right, so we want to understand that what like you are requesting for an, a location to be retrieved. Right, so we have to deal with uh, disambiguation, right? Uh, so that's why we need place, dis place name disambiguation, which uh, uses context and semantic filtering, right? From the beginning, I can start with a good semantic filter that can uh, establish the uh, semantic, con like the spatial context. For example, the work that we've done in Hazard Seas in our project is we started with a good semantic filtering. We started with a, a, an established spatial context of a campaign. So, for example, we know where uh, Chennai tweets, like where are we, like for example, in, in terms of an, a hurricane or a disaster, right? If we're talking about, let's say, Houston uh, 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 disasters or hurricane, right? So we know what is the boundary for that hurricane, the spatial context, right? So, for example, if there is a mention in the tweet that says data in the tweets of Houston, right? Then I will totally know that I'm not talking about data in the one in Ohio because it has nothing to do with the hurricane. So it's out of context. So if we have a good semantic filter to begin with, then we will be able to sort, partially solve the place disambiguation problem, right? But imagine that we have the same name in the same a geospatial bounding box, in the same bounding box. For example, let's say that uh, I draw a, a bounding box above Houston and I have two datums there, right? How can I understand that we are talking about this datum, not that datum, right? And this is a, like a very huge subject to talk about. Um, and there is a bunch of, uh, of research um, that uses, for example, the accompanying location names mentioned in the same tweet or what is that uh, user is talking about all the time. So finding the spatial footprint of that user and then inference the uh, spatial uh, 
a footprint of the location mentioned that I'm talking about, right? And you have all sorts of complexities too. So, uh, for example, uh, if I am talking about a hurricane in Houston, that doesn't mean that I'm there, right? Uh, which adds uh, like insult to injury. So, uh, so that's why we need more complex kind of computations and uh, clearer semantics, more complex semantics, so we can understand things. Um, so this kind of, uh, of thing is closely uh, related to the term that you can always like hear in literature, which is geoparsing, uh, which is the detection of place names and then disambiguating them. So if we're talking about geoparsing tweets, means that I'm extracting the, uh, the, the location names from the tweets and then disambiguating them uh, after the linking. So I, I extract them from the text, which is called delimitation, right, in any R, delimitation, linking, and then disambiguation, right? Which is, in other terms, um, delimitation, uh, resolution, entity resolution, and then there is the disambiguation, which means uh, which footprint are we talking about? But in any R, we are talking about uh, which entity class are we talking about, right? So we can extract information, uh, geographical information from tweets, for example, um, um, user localization, or we can uh, do tweet localization, and these are, can be done from the tweet metadata, right, like the profile field, place field, geo coordinates, or the tweet text itself, which means that I need to do the location name extraction using the NLP and the machine learning we talked about before. The other thing is we can do is to extract locations from geotagged pictures. Um, so if the user is taking pictures of a, of a hurricane or whatever, then and they are geo uh, stamped, right? I would be able to go and retrieve those. The other thing is, as we said, the social network analysis for location inference. So now let's go back a little bit and talk about the what does that all mean for us as uh, application developers and as uh, researchers and people who design solutions, right? As you know, our motto here is, uh, you know, um, from information to meaning. So we want to go from uh, something just very shallow to something <coughs> that is meaningful uh, and computing for a human experience. So, uh, so first of all, let's talk about the place semantics, right? Uh, so place semantics, you can look at it as uh, in three different dimensions. Uh, thematic, which means, uh, for example, user reviews. You want to see, like here, for example, you can see that there are two different clouds based on the reviews of locations, of restaurants, right? Locations, actually, not restaurants. So if you just look at the word clouds, you will know that A is... Um, restaurant and B is football field, right? Just by looking at the word cloud and frequencies. And that's the theme of that location. This is what the place semantic, this is what it means. This is what it represents in real life, right? Spatial semantics is about the spatial relationships. So in a knowledge graph or a knowledge base, I know that Dayton is part of Green County, Green County is in Ohio, Ohio is in United States, and so on, right? Or I can do the geocomputations, which is um, using the world ge you know, uh, coordination system, right? So I can know such, such spatial relationship between things. Like, for example, I can say that between me and you is four meters, right? That's a relationship between me and you. And actually, there is a paper by Dr. Shedd that's called um, uh, Relations at, this, at the Heart of the Semantic Web, which is very important to know. Relations are, are actually really in the heart of the semantics. Uh, the third dimension is the temporal dimension, uh, which is the, uh, uh, you can think of it as the user location interactions. For example, I come to Wright State University, you come to Riyadh State University, then there is uh, uh, some kind of a pattern, there is some kind of a relation, we go together to some place, 
right? So that's a place semantic, right? People go, for example, in the mornings to restaurants, um, in the afternoon to uh, bars, oh, well, not bars, in the evenings to bars. Uh, anyway, you get what I mean. <laughs> So to capture more semantics, or in a different way to capture such semantics, is to use the uh, place sim similarity measures, right? And these measures are like, for example, the minimum bonding box. Like, for example, I can say, okay, based on a four by four kilometers bonding box, give me all these location names, right? Which means that I'm actually drawing a relationship based on them being inside the bonding box. Right? If I talk about the node proximity in the gazetteer graph, right, then I will be able to say that, okay, uh, Ohio is five edges away, according to Manhattan distance, from uh, North Dakota, for example. Right? So, that, so if I don't have an actual hierarchical relationships that is already represented in the knowledge representation, then I will not be able to do such things, do not, I will not be able to do such inferences, right? And then I can ask again the, cord, the, the world coordination system to ask the geographical distance between two things, the Ohio and North Dakota, and then I can say that they are 1,200 miles away from each other. Now, we come again to something that Dr. Schiff talked about in this class, which is the semantics for the semantic web, right? I call, in my case, geosemantics for the semantic web. The implicit, the formal, and the powerful. Remember that paper? Yes. Yeah. So I just want to explain what does that mean for us as a, as a geosemantics kind of talk, right? If we are talking about the implicit semantics, right? Then means, for example, See, this, these are actually just, I copied it from, uh, from Google. So these are actual texts. Uh, the first one says the province Dayton and Fairborn, comma, Ohio. Fairborn is a city near Dayton, and then book the Hampton in Dayton slash Fairborn, right? If I just do um, a bag of words model or um, a sliding window of, of words, right? And then I can tie Dayton with Fairborn, I can say that Dayton and Fairborn have an actual relationship based on the text, based on their mentions together inside, uh, inside the text, right? And that's the implicit semantics that that paper is talking about, right? You cannot see them unless you actually aggregate them, right? The formal semantics is when I say that USA is a uh, parent is Earth, USA belongs to North America, Ohio is a, uh, the, has a parent of uh, USA, and United States of America and Bergartenstaaten in German means that USA, right? In two different, in English and German, right? So these are the formal ones. These are encoded. These are retrieved. Like, I can retrieve them. I encode them, right, as a human, as an engineer. I can encode such semantics and then I can retrieve them later on. So these are the formal ones that we are talking about. The powerful ones are the ones that, are, that need lots of, uh, I mean, more computation. It needs uh, like statistical models, uh, uh, machine learning models, and so on, so I can understand the semantics uh, of, 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 of like locations, right? Places, the geosemantics. So if we talk about the check-in uh, patterns that we talked about before, if, for example, that um, uh, people check at the same time to restaurants and the other guy, same time, restaurant, same time, restaurant, then what is the probability that this one is, is a restaurant also, right? If I know this kind of patterns of, of check-in to, uh, to, to, to places, then I might also propagate the semantics of those to the other ones that I don't know anything about. And that's why we call them the powerful semantics. They are not there. I was very smart to get them, right? By doing, you know, genius 
machine learning and statistical modeling. I'm not listening. So here's one example of problem that do it, this exact thing. Um, so this example problem of, from a paper on KDD, uh, it talks about the spatial temporal uh, place semantics. And the problem statement is like this. Like 30% of places collected from uh, world, this is like a deceased uh, location network. Um, and four square are lacking any mean f meaning for textual descriptions. So for example, I know that uh, people uh, check in so many places, but I do not know what are the types of the, some other places, right? For example, I know that this guy went to shop for clothes, this guy went to a cafe at a particular time. So we have a spatial temporal relationship between a user and a location, right? And we have more semantics for some locations, like those. I know that this is a boutique, this is I know that this is cafe, but I didn't know this one, for example. So I want to do inference of the powerful semantics, right? I want to extract them and propagate them to the other ones. So what, we, uh, what they did in their paper is uh, they extracted descriptive features of places based on the user check-in behavior from explicit patterns of individual places and the implicit relatedness among similar places. I will talk about those things and what they mean. And the solution for that is to use multi-label classification for semantic labeling. So at the end of the day, I will be able to say that this location that I don't know anything about might be a restaurant based on the check-in uh, uh, um, behavior of users for other ones that I know about. Right? So the explicit patterns that we are talking about is the uh, summarized uh, 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 from uh, check-ins at a specific place extractable directly from the user behavior and um, the, place, the, the place semantic description is aggregated over a single place is derived from the population feature which is the number of unique visitors and the temporal features with, which is the description uh, distribution of check-ins times so these are already there these are you don't have to do any computation to get them these are explicit, explicit patterns right they are just in the data I can extract them for example, I can say that people visit restaurants at regular meal times. Is this true or not? I can just immediately check that. I don't need to do any machine learning or any statistical modeling. The implicit relatedness is, is not as straightforward as the explicit patterns. And those are derived by building a network of related places. right? Uh, we derive features of a place from similar places, as I said before, and we rely on the regularity of user check-in to similar places. So we have the, they have the assumption that uh, people check in similar places in similar times, similar uh, spa uh, temporal uh, uh, from a temporal perspective. Like for example, checking in regularly at similar time to eat lunch will help in predicting the one that you know. Uh, do not have uh, attack, right? So again, summary of those features. Uh, for the explicit ones, we have number of check-ins, number of unique visitors, and so on. For the implicit ones, we have the relative of the check-in, museums in the morning, uh, restaurants <laughs> at meal times, shopping at about 4 p.m., right? That I can see these uh, in there, and I want to use those to uh, to to, to get the semantics of the other ones that I don't know anything about, right? So for the spatial temporal feature extraction, uh, they built a network of related places, uh, a two, gra uh, two bipartite graphs. The first one is the user place graph, as you can see here, which is a bipartite graph, have users and places, and you have, you see, edges. So these edges are drawn with no temporal perspective. I just saw that, for example, user one goes to that place this many times. And that's the weight of that edge. You can see here is the weight of this edge, number of visits to that place. The other dimension of this data is the, the, the times and the places, right? For example, I know that uh, 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 this place is being uh, uh, 
uh, visited in this interval of time, for example, at noon, and you can say like 20, uh, like 11.45 to 12.15, 12, you can say that that's noon, according to the definition. And then you can aggregate, and that's the weight of this edge. That you can say that at noon, at this interval, this many times of visits I have, right? So I have two different bipartite graphs, and they want now to merge them to get the relatedness of places together, right? Based on the spatial and temporal perspectives. And this is what they end up with. These are the scores that we saw before, right? And they use, you know, uh, a random walk to calculate the relatedness between uh, the user and place and the time and place. And then they time them together using this equation. At the end of the day, they use these features that they just got now to train an SVM binary classifier for each tag. So you can say that it's a multivariate uh, classification, right? So I can say that uh, these are the training data set. Place one is a bar, place two is a bar and, and whatever, right? Um, and the testing data set is, I don't know anything about, I want to predict what is the type of that application. And this is what they did. I'm not gonna report any results. The idea here is just to expose you to the such kind of, how do we use the spatial temporal or the spatial footprint to understand and to get to extract more and more meaningful semantics. An example too of uh, such a work is uh, to summarize uh, area summaries from geotagged images. So if I know where the image is, I can pinpoint it to, a, to a, a point on the map using the world coordination system. And then I can aggregate the description of these images, right? I can build summaries, as you can see here, like the summary of an area, and that what are people talking about here. So for example, um, they know that around somewhere here is the Empire State Building, I think it's around here. Empire State Building, and so on and so forth. So these are the paper. Uh, these are what the people talk about, right? Here? Yeah. Good. Yeah. So I just the... I'm done. This is the last slide. <laughs> um, this, uh, this question was... Uh, posed by Dr. Schiff in one of his keynotes in 2010. It was seven years ago. Um, that uh, keynote is called um, Spatial Semantics for Better Interoperability and Analysis. Right? And they said, in the beginning of that keynote, he said, w he posed this question, like, what schools should be closed in Ohio due to inclement weather, right? And the whole talk was about how do you use semantic web to answer that question, right? And I want to give you that judgment. I want, I want you to answer that question for yourself. Do you think semantic web is easy? And as, is, is like as it is now, is it easy to answer this question or it needs so much computing to do it, right? Let's talk about it. So we have a spatial data and we have sensor data. Spatial data, for example, we have a spatial relationships between locations. We have a gazetteer, like let's say open street map, right? Then can we do, um, um, yeah, let's wait. Um, so for the sensor data, we have to do some processing to decide what makes the weather dangerous. So these are the things that are posed here in this question, right? Like, um, what schools should be closed in Ohio? So which means I want to understand what are the schools in Ohio, first of all, right? So that's why we need a special, uh, a, a good uh, a knowledge representation somewhere that can tell me that this school is inside Ohio, right? But the problem is, in semantic web, this is what you can see in the keynote, is that uh, schools are not of an immediate uh, uh, autonomy relationship with the state, right? 
So you can't find a school that has an actual edge, like an immediate edge that is connected between a school and a, and a state. Instead, you will find that there are states and there are counties and there are then districts and then the schools are under the districts, right? And the semantic web solution for this problem is to, to map that Sparkle query into so many other queries for it to answer that question at the end. So for example, I can say that Ohio, oh, it's a state. It's not a district. So how can I reach the district? I have to say, okay, what are the districts of, what are the counties of Ohio? What are the districts of, of, uh, of the counties of Ohio? And then what are the schools of the districts of the counties of Ohio? See, that's how the semantic web does it. I argue that using GIR and filtering, I can, use, I can do it in a much, much easier and much straightforward way that is much easier than this approach, which is I can search using a warning box above the Ohio State, right? And then at the end of the day, I'm gonna uh, just remove the ones that have a state, not Ohio, because it's accessible, right? So using the geospatial footprint, the geo coordinates, I can know that these schools are inside Ohio and then remove the ones that are, do not have a state as the parent, like Ohio as not, is not the state defined there, which is much, much easier than going and doing all of this and sparkle and divide it in so many sparkle quizzes and so on, right? And that's, guys, if you bear with me for this much of time, you can bear with me for this small idea, which is, that's why semantic web is struggling. Because it's not simplifying things. This kind of thing can be actually simplified by having a good knowledge representation other than just a hierarchical kind of representation in sign that's agassative, right? You agree with me? Like I use the geo, the, the uh, word uh, um, coordination system, which my, makes my life much, much easier, right? So this kind of things that we need in the semantic world, we need to simplify things. We need to make things more accessible, uh, less hectic to use. Like I don't need to do research 10 years so I can answer this question, right? Because it needs so much time and work actually. So now, in, in, in terms of the sensor data, we need to understand what makes a, a weather dangerous, right? Like due to inclement weather. What makes a weather dangerous? <laughs> and what are the policies of closing schools in Ohio? I need to understand all of this so I can fully automatically solve this question. And then I need to understand the spatial context of the sensor data, right? That spatial context is very nice and very easy. I can get it. But I will not be able to know where that is unless I have a good knowledge representation again, right? If I have it, if I can say that, oh, this sensor is inside that city, oh, that city is inside that, right? It's not going to happen because I don't know if this weather station actually covers that school or not. So I have to have the geo coordinates so I can know the spatial context and the area of coverage of a sensor data, right? Sensor reading. So that's what I will leave you with, just like to think what are the ups and downs of using um, semantic web technologies and how can we simplify them? Semantic web is very powerful, but the problem is sometimes the actual technology of semantic web is the bottleneck and you see the the low adoption of Sparkle and whatever, these are all technologies. This have nothing to do with semantics. Semantics are there since ages, since 2400 years ago. People <laughs> talked about the, the triangle of reference, right? And some people say, oh, if you are not doing RDF, you are not doing semantic web. This is nonsense, right? Semantic web has nothing to do with the technology. If you decide to do the technology this way, this doesn't mean that this is you are just bounding that, that, that actually very, very powerful concept, which is the semantic web. Thank you. <laughs>